Jesus. You're worthy to be praised, God. Holy, holy is your name, God. Worthy, worthy, Jesus. Yeah, come on, just where you're at. Just begin to cry out to him this morning. Oh, Jesus. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. You're the reason why we're set free this morning, God. You're the reason why our lives are forever changed, God. You're the reason why drug addiction is canceled in our families, Lord. You're the reason that alcoholism is canceled. Oh, it's canceled over every generation, God, because we said yes to you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, God. Yes, we thank you. We thank you, God. Oh, we enter your courts with thanksgiving, Lord, and praise. Jesus, thank you, God. Oh, it's in your presence, Lord, where we are found in you. Here in your presence, we are undone. Here in your presence, heaven and earth become, yeah. Here in your presence, all things are new. Here in your presence, everything bows before you. Yeah, let's sing that again. Here in your presence, we are undone. Here in your presence, heaven and earth become. Yes, Jesus, here in your presence, all things are new, yeah. here in your presence, everything bows before, yes, Jesus, you are wonderful. You're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way, one, yeah. You're beautiful, yeah, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way, wonderful, you're beautiful, yes, Jesus, yes, you are glorious, oh. You're beautiful, yeah, glorious. Yeah, let your praises rise. Come on. Wonderful, beautiful. You're glorious. You're matchless in every way. Wonderful. You're beautiful, yeah. You're glorious. Yeah. Matchless in every way. You're glorious, you're matchless in every way, wonderful, you're beautiful, yeah, glorious, yeah, keep singing it, matchless, wonderful, you're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way, wonderful, you're beautiful, 
you're glorious, you're matchless in every way. You're matchless, you're matchless, Lord. Yeah. Oh, no one compares to the King of Kings, the Lord. Yes, you're wonderful. Yes, you're beautiful, Jesus. Oh, we were created to worship you, Lord. Oh, even the rocks cry out, God, because you are worthy, God. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are wonderful. You're glorious, you're matchless in, yeah, sing it. ministering all over this place. Just keep singing it out. Wonderful. You're beautiful. You're glorious. Matchless. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, God. You are glorious, Jesus. Wonderful. Beautiful and glorious, matchless in every way, wonderful. You're beautiful, you're glorious, you're matchless in every way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Why don't we just uh, open this morning in prayer. Father, Lord, we just thank you for this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it, Lord God. Father, have your way this morning. Speak to our hearts. Lord, your presence is here. You've set a wonderful table for us, Lord God. Let us eat from it this morning, Lord God. So, Father, Lord God, just, just... Speak to us and touch us, challenge us, convict us, stir us up, Lord God. Help us to be more like you. Help us to draw closer to you, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you for all you've done already. We give you the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. This morning, praise the Lord. Thank you, team. Amen. God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. We've made it. We've made it to Friday. Amen. We made it to Friday. Started Tuesday night with our pastors and leaders gathering. And here we are. Friday is here. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad that uh, you've made the sacrifice to be here uh, in these morning sessions, and what a powerful time it was yesterday, morning and night. Everything is just, God is orchestrated. The thing I love about these conferences is, man, it's just, the Holy Spirit just orchestrates, right? He just does it, amen. Nobody, none of these pastors share each other's notes and say, what are you speaking on? I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Uh, it's like the Lord just knows what needs to be brought out, and uh, we just receive from it, right? And so it's just been a powerful time. And so uh, this morning... As we did yesterday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce uh, the, the first three speakers that are going to speak this morning. 
Their responsibility is to pass the baton, amen, to be sensitive of their time to the, following, to the next speaker. And then after the third speaker, we're going to have a 20-minute break, and then we'll come back for the final speaker this morning. But this is who's coming up here this morning. We're so excited. From Praise Chapel Fullerton, we're going to have Pastor Albert Garcia. He's going to be, he's going to minister. Hallelujah. From Firehouse Bre- uh, Brea, Pastor Fernando Viacana is going to be with us. And from Freedom House, San Jacinto, Pastor Randy Emerson, all right? And so, uh, praise the Lord. Give Pastor Albert a hand clap as he comes. Father, thank you. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> um, uh, praise the Lord. Good to be here with you. I find it to be a great uh, blessing uh, to be able to minister the word of the Lord in this house. Um, I'm, I don't use an iPad, as you can tell. I'm using paper. I probably killed uh, maybe 200 trees in the, just the time I've been pastoring. But this is what I feel comfortable with. I think Jesus used paper. That's more anointed than the iPad. <laughs> Amen. And that's all right. If you brought an iPad, we still love you. We still accept you. We're united with you. And uh, I just have to struggle more. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of John 17. And as you do that, I want to thank Pastor Donna and uh, Pastor Jason and Pastor Jackie uh, for entrusting this podium to me. And I'll tell you why that's important, because whatever is said from here uh, has an, a direct effect in people's lives. Uh, whether you think it doesn't or you think it does, it's irrelevant. Once it enters in you, it has a way to influencing you. And so I approached this podium uh, with reverence, uh, try to add and to enhance what the spirit of this conference is and not to take away from it. And so uh, I'm going to try to do just that, and uh, I'm going to ask you to open Uh, the Word of God to the book of John chapter 17. I'm going to read this with you. If my buttons open up, I have this shirt on, and uh, before I even get started, uh, when I was young, uh, I I had it all together. As I got a little older, I've actually preached sermons with my fly down the entire service and did not even know it until someone brought it to my attention. So, I was. I made very uh, made sure that before I came up here, I checked the fly and checked the buttons. But because I've gained a little weight and I'm not uh, oblivious to the fact that I have, uh, I'm not in self denial. Sometimes my buttons don't keep up with me, and so if that happens, I have my wife on the front row, who she will she will signal me. Uh, I I don't need. Um, I don't eat McDonald's burgers uh, like Pastor does. I don't like McDonald's, uh, but I do like ice cream. (laughs) I do like cookies and some of that stuff that's not. And I like it late at night (laughs) because uh, coming home after preaching, you just want to sit down Turn on Kings and Queens and have a bowl of ice cream. As you can tell, as you can tell, I've done a good job at that. The book of uh, 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 Brother Al Limas, uh, who's here, he he keeps. I've seen him every night, and he says, Pastor Robert, do not take your shirt off. And the reason he says that is in the men's discipleship, I actually did that, and I'm not sure if he was trying to use reverse psychology to make me take my shirt off. Maybe there's a deep longing in him. (laughs) Whatever the case may be, the book of John, chapter 17. Neither I pray for these alone only, but for them also which shall believe, be persuaded, have faith in, or trust on me. 
through their word, that they all, all of them whole, may be one of the same. One of the same is the real the transliteration there. That they may be all one of the same as thou, Father, are in, say in. In is a fixed position. A fixed position means it's not movable. He says that they may all be in a fixed position as I am in a fixed position with thee. Jesus was unmovable. And that they also may be in a fixed position with us. That the world, as a result of this relationship, that the world may believe, be persuaded, have faith, put their trust that you sent me. And the glory, doxa, the glory, doxa, which is really a word that means reputation. Jesus was a man of no reputation. That the reputation that you gave me, <clears throat> excuse me, that I may give it to them. That they may be one, say one, of the same, of the same, that they may be one of the same, even as we are one of the same. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be perfect, teleos, a full age through the process of the relationship vertically and horizontally. And as a result that the world may know that you sent me and that you have loved me and that I have loved them. I want to minister today for a few moments on the topic of oneness. Oneness. The year was 1971. The astronaut by the name of Edgar Mitchell, who probably you'll see a picture behind me momentarily, yes. He was launched into space in 1971, and from 230,000 miles into space, he looked down at the tiny little marble that we call Earth. And as he's looking down to Earth from space, he says his whole life changed. He says, it changed in a moment's time, he says, and I quote him, quote, it was an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion or an obligation, rather, to do something about it. He's looking down to earth, and he's dissatisfied when he sees that little globe from a distance. He says and goes on to say, quote, suddenly all the squabbles of the earth seem so petty. He says, the difference between nations and races all fell away from me. He says, the urgency of trivial problems seemed to disappear. He says, I was left with only a sense of connectedness and compassion for everyone and everything. Going on, he continues and he says, quote, All I can think of in my spaceship was grabbing every selfish politician by the neck and pulling them up to space and saying to them, Look, man, look, man, look. It's not that I was angry, he articulates. In fact, I never felt more calmer. And then I was overwhelmed by a great desire, he says. Quote, 
My desire was for all the leaders of the people who are supposed to work on behalf of their fellow citizens to experience the very same thing that I was experiencing 239,000 miles into space. He says, I wanted them all to experience this, that we are all one. I wanted them to experience that we are all in this thing together. He says, I wanted them to experience this mindset that the oneness of life is the most important thing in existence. Today, if you haven't guessed it, I'm going to minister on oneness. Oneness. It was Seneca, or Seneca, however you may refer to, a Roman Stoic philosopher of 65 AD, who makes this staggering statement, quote, all that you belong, that which comprises both God and man is one. We are all parts of one great body. Mahatma Gandhi, who was a nationalist, and a lawyer attorney in the 1800s makes this statement, quote, I believe in the absolute oneness of God and humanity. We may not look the same. We may not act the same. We may not all come from the same backgrounds. When I walked into this church 36 years ago, I was about the only white-looking guy other than Pastor Mike and Donna Neville in this house. And sometimes I can hear people speak thinking I did not know Spanish, but I read every word. Let me tell you something, friend. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born in. It doesn't matter whether you went to Yale, Harvard, or Compton University. We are all one. We are all one. We are in this thing together. And the one thing that matters more than anything else is the realization that we're together in this thing. In our text, Jesus is speaking some farewell words to his disciples. For five chapters, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, we can hear some of the most tender-hearted words ever spoken and recorded in Scripture. In John 14, he speaks to them while he sits at the table of the Last Supper. In John 15 through 17, he speaks to them as he's walking with them to, toward Gethsemane. Excuse me. In these five chapters, Jesus shares some of the most deepest compassionate, comforting, and encouraging words he had ever shared with his disciples. And they're all around, surround the issue of oneness. In John 14, 1, he tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Pastor, don't let your heart be troubled this morning. In John 4, 2, he tells them, I am going to prepare a place for you. In John 14, 14, he tells him, you may ask me anything in my name, and you can guarantee I will do it for you. Pastors, he's there for you. In John 14, 16, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to help you and to be with you forever. In John 15, 9, he says, as the Father has loved me, I now love you. In John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants. I call you my friends. Amen. In John 16, 1, he says, all this I have told you so that you would not fall away from me. And in John 16, he says, I have told you all these things so that in me you can have peace. I've had my shares of turmoil, and this scripture helps. And then in our text, in John 17, he begins to pray to the Father. And he says to the Father in verse 23, I in them, 
thou in me, that they may be perfect. Let me talk to you for a few moments on the power of oneness. Oneness. The saving faith of the world depends on our ability to become one with God and one with each other. I know that this may be a trip up theologically for many folks, and I understand that. But I'm going to repeat that, that the faith of your family, the salvation of your families, your friends, those around you, sometimes is very dependent on our ability to demonstrate oneness with God and oneness with one another. If you notice in verse 21, Jesus says something powerful. He says uh, that all of them be one, talking to his disciples, that they would be of the same. Father, just as you are in me, we are the same, and I am in you, and may they also be in us that the world may believe as a result of oneness. The biggest turnoff. And walking into a church is seeing a divisive, divided church that tears himself apart. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to participate in that. I want to be in a place uh, where Jesus is glorified, where people love each other regardless of race, color, or preferences. Friends, that is the faith. This is what's necessary if we are going to make an impact, a true impact. In our communities. What Jesus is saying is simple. That the faith of the world, our family, friends, and communities is interdependent on our ability to love each other and to love God. That power is not found in our oratory skills. You can preach the best sermons and still not affect anyone. The disciples were uneducated men and yet they transformed the world. This power is not found in our programs. I know that there are a lot of great programs out there, and I've tried a lot of them, and none of them work for me. I'll tell you what works. It's when there is a true, genuine love for God and a true, genuine love for my neighbor, and there is a oneness in all of that. That's what becomes attractive. This power is not found in how many people I can muster and gather on a Sunday morning service. It's only found in my ability to be one with you and with God. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 44 it says all the believers, listen, the revival that was experienced in the New Testament was predicated on their oneness. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 44 and 47 it says all the believers were together and had everything in common. Listen, look for oneness here. And they sold their property and possession and gave to anyone who had a need. Every day, I say every day, every day, every day, every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes, they ate together, they had glad and sincere hearts, they praised God, they enjoyed the favor of all people, and as a result, the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. Why, friends? Because this was a church that understood the power of oneness. Yes, it was the Holy Ghost. It was the power of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that gave them the ability to become one. For friends, we have no excuse. We've got the Holy Ghost. we got the living Word of God. And all we've got to do is say, Lord, help me to be one with my brother, with my sister, and with you. That's revival. Doesn't matter what came in in the roster, that's revival. Doesn't matter what came in on the offering basket, that's still Revival. I'm not saying you shouldn't give. You should give. You know better than that. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira was nothing more than a sin against oneness. It had nothing to do with money. As pastors, it's our primary responsibility to activate, stimulate, and maintain a spirit of oneness in our congregations at whatever 
whatever the cost. The pandemic did not test the hearts of men. It merely revealed what was already in the hearts of men. It revealed who really was one with us and who was not one with us. During the pandemic, I asked myself some serious questions. I asked myself, why are we doing what we're doing? What is motivating our ministries? Are people serving out of obligation? Are people serving out of fear? Are they serving out of the big three, loyalty, commitment, and faithfulness? Are they serving out of selfish ambition as a platform for something greater? Or are they serving just to please their pastors? I asked myself these questions in the pandemic, and I came in with some staggering answers and results. And I said to myself, from now on, from this day forward, we are going to do nothing or anything unless it is motivated by two principles. We are going to love God with all our hearts, and we are going to love each other with all our hearts. And once we get and get that done. He says, that's the preeminent. That is what's necessary to do whatever we do. I'm sick and tired of seeing people doing things for the wrong motives. Sick and tired of seeing ushers with a bad attitude on a Sunday morning. I'm sick and tired of seeing sister so-and-so that comes into the church, carries an eight-foot Bible, prays and speaks in tongues, uh, come against somebody else in the church because somebody took her chair. Friends, that's not oneness. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not why he called us. That's not why we're here. We are here to become one, one with God and one with each other. Jesus said the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. I was pastoring no more than a year, preaching my heart out. I had a lot more gas in my tank back then. And in the middle of my sermon, someone says, Pastor, Pastor, you got to come out here. And I said, how dare you interrupt my sermon? Not even God does that. <laughs> Some of you missed that. I went out there and there was our head usher in a fist fight with another usher. I said, Lord, give me other people. Give me, I, I know we, we pastors, we think this way sometimes, Lord, give me people that have it together. Pastor Mike Neville used to say, we want the people that nobody else wants. You can have those, I'll take the other ones. <laughs> They're duking it out. They're, they're fighting. They're they're. they're yelling and I'm thinking to myself where is the spirit of love where is the spirit we don't need ushers fighting in the parking lot we don't need people doing that kind that's not oneness I've got to start winding down or I just may fulfill Al Lemus's wish let me finish oneness is at the heart of true spiritual maturity. I'm going to make some statements that are going to make some people upset, and I, I'm okay with that. I'll probably never come back. <laughs> I'm all right with that. I'm not trying to undo what... See, I'm not here, first and foremost, I'm not here to be a father to this house. This is not my place. I'm not your father. I'm your brother. So I don't dare in any way try to stand behind this podium and try to bring correction to a congregation that's not mine, that's not my place. 
I don't go, you don't come into my house and discipline my children. That's my business, not your business. So my aim is not to bring correction to the church, but to hopefully inspire your heart. Oneness is at the heart of true spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity does not happen by reading my Bible and attending church. I know some pastors are shaking in their seats right now. That's okay. Some of the meanest people I've met in church are Bible-carrying, tongue-talking, devil-casting Christians. They're always in church, and they're the meanest of all. Not all of them. Now, in all fairness, I am not saying, I am not saying, I'm going to reemphasize on purpose, I am not saying that you should neglect Bible reading and church attendance. I've been doing this for 36 years, and I'll do it for the rest of my life. So I'm not saying neglect that. Don't go to your pastor and say, I'm not coming this Sunday because Pastor Albert preached that. You're twisting the scriptures to suit your own fancy. What I am saying is this, that true spiritual maturity is predicated on my ability to be one with God and one with you. That's how I grow. I grow through relationship. The teachers of the law knew the Torah, and yet they crucified our master. In our text, Jesus said, I in them, fixed position. Thou in me, fixed position, that they may be perfect, fully grown through relationship. It is no wonder that Paul had to write to the Corinthians that says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. You are mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food. You were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready because you are still worldly since there is jealousy and quarrelings and divisions among you. Are you not worldly? Paul is saying, I can't help you. I can't minister to you because you're still an infant. There is no relational experience between you. You are fighting. You are tearing each other apart. He says, you are still infants infants because of that. The absence, I'm going to really wind down here, the absence of oneness is at the root of every preventable human suffering. Let me say this again. The absence of oneness is at the root of every preventable human suffering, is at the root of every war. I have my son in the Navy on the Abraham Lincoln as we speak, and he is surrounding the Black Sea, China and Korea, awaiting from orders from the U.S. government whether they're going to get involved in Ukraine or not. The absence of oneness is at the root of every preventable human suffering, every divorce, Every family feud, every church split, and every suicide. I was nine years old. We came from Cuba. My mother fell into a deep, deep depression. If you have been with me in our church for a while, I apologize for my redundancy up ahead because you've heard this, but some have not. I was nine years old. My mother took a hand filled with pills and swallowed them because she wanted to end her life. At nine years old, I woke up in my pajamas and my mother is convulsing 
on the family couch. I grabbed her by her pajama tops and shook her and said, Mom, you can't do this. What's wrong with you? What can a nine-year-old understand? Moments later, the paramedics pulled up and took her, pumped her stomach. Years later, my mom is here today. Years later, she, I asked her, I said, what made you do such a thing? Did you not like us? Were we so bad that you had to leave us? And with tears rolling down her cheeks, she said, No, son, I loved you. I just felt so alone. Twenty veterans will take their lives every day. by suicide while the church is bickering and tearing each other up. Teenage suicide has become the third leading cause of death in America while the church tears itself apart. Let me conclude. What do I do? How do we Achieve oneness. Simple, not hard at all. Humbly do the work of self-realization or self-reflection. Look inside and ask yourself, is my behavior promoting or desecrating oneness? Paul said, examine yourselves. We're good at pointing at everybody else. Pastor Mike used to say, when you point at someone, you got three coming back at you. I never forgot that. Examine yourself. Ask yourself this question. Is my behavior a matter of defensive projection? What is defensive projection? It is a defense mechanism within us psychologically which projects our fears, our insecurities, our negativities, and emotion concerns onto others. It's what I'm going through, and I'm going to project it on you and blame you for it. That's called scapegoating. You want to be free from division? Look inside. Second and finally, reject all forms of dualism and pluralism. What do I mean by that? We need to stop with the us versus them mentality. It's not us versus them. We are together in this thing. We are one. We cannot afford to demonize other people because of their race. We can't demonize people because of their color, their status, their religion, their political parties, or even their sexual orientation. Oh, boy. I was at an outreach. I'm almost done here. I know you're waiting for my mic, and I I got you, brother. I was at an outreach two weeks ago, and a woman dressed in her lesbian garb came to me and said, if I go to your church, will you love me? And, of course, I gave her the typical answer that most people do. Of course, we love you. Just come. And she said, no, 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 that's not what I asked you. She says, I'm married with my wife. I says, if I come to your church, could I participate in the Lord's Supper? Could I participate in ministry? So many thoughts ran through my mind. I wanted to say yes, yes, yes. And then on the other side, no, no, no. What do I do with that? We can say, well, she's a lesbian and she should not have. I wonder how many people you put behind the podium who have a lust issue. I have to be real with myself. What makes my sin different from hers? 
I don't have the answer to that. I don't intend to. But I want to stimulate your thinking to start thinking in that direction. I want a church full of lesbians and homos and I want them all, drug addicts, and I just don't know how to move that around. Let me leave you with this thought. The words of Edgar Michael. As I look down to earth from 239,000 miles into space, my experience was one of instant global consciousness a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. All the squabbles of the earth seem petty. The urgency of trivial problems all disappeared. What was left was a real sense of connectedness and compassion for everyone and everything. I wanted everyone to know three things. One, that we are all one, that we are all in this thing together, and that the only thing that truly matters is oneness. That's my message. God bless you. Pastor Albert, come on, give him a hand there. We are glad that your button's held up, but we're exceedingly glad that your fly stayed where it was supposed to stay. Last thing we want is for any pastor to come up here and openly display his shortcomings. I told him I got the mic next. You be careful with me. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> it's not a smart thing to do, is it? But no brains, no headaches. It's one thing I don't have to worry about. Good sermon. Good points. Thank you, Pastor Albert. Thank you for that. I, I, too, want to echo his thoughts in regards to uh, having a sense of honor and privilege and gratitude for being able to minister at this conference. Thank you, Pastor Jason, Pastor Donna. Appreciate it so much. Well, I've been, I've been pastoring uh, over 30 years, and the reason I mention that is because we've had a lot of discussion. We're connecting with a lot of people here. One of the great things about conference for us pastors that have been out for quite a while is the connection and to come back and see your friends and give each other a high five and it seems like the older we get the uh, the conversation uh, seems to be more medical and and all that other stuff but that happens but <laughs> I had a uh, well it, you know I, I really love pastoring I, I just want to say I, I really enjoy pastoring we've been pastoring over 30 years and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that happen when you pastor. Yeah, you hear about a lot of those different things. It's not without its challenges. But we love doing it, and we look forward to more years doing it. We just love, love being involved in ministry. Uh, a little while ago, a couple, a couple weeks ago, a, a pastor friend recommended a TV series. Said, you got to check out this series. It's a TV series. You can find it on Paramount Plus, and it's called 1883. It's with Sam Elliott. Lone Star Barbecue Sauce. You know that guy, uh, Sam Elliott. So uh, we were checking it out. And the whole, the whole uh, series, uh, there's 10 episodes in the series. And it's uh, on a kind of a true account of many, many years ago, like 1883. It's cowboys, certain cowboys that were hired or brought on to lead a bunch of immigrants on a, on a journey of over 1,500 miles from Texas to Oregon. They called it the Oregon Trail. 
Really interesting. We really got into it. It's about a group of people who were unprepared. They were unaware. They were totally ill-equipped to make this long journey. They weren't used to the wilderness. And these cowboys are telling them, listen, you have no idea what you're up against here. Are you sure you want to try this? Yeah, we want to, we want to do it. And they, they did it with uh, uh, covered wagons. And they walked. And they had some oxen and different things like that. But along the way, they encountered a lot of problems. They didn't know about Comanches. They didn't know about bandits and thieves. They didn't know about rattlesnakes. Some of them were bit along the way. There was illness. There was death. All these things. Anybody here ever been involved in ministry or along your journey? You've been bit by a few rattlesnakes. Have you ever, have you ever, come on, the pastors are all raising their hands. Have you ever been in a place where uh, there's been in-house bandits and thieves? I mean, you're on your journey to paradise, and that's what they called it. They called Oregon their destination paradise. All throughout the series, they were saying, we're on our way to paradise. But along the road, there were so many things that were happening. You know, in my over 30 years of ministry, I've experienced my share of some of these things. Comanches, bandits, thieves, snakes, storms. But I'll tell you something, the journey is great because of all the great things that God is doing. And I, I'm still here after all these years. And with everything that the devil's thrown at the church, come on, we're still here. Give somebody next to you a high five and say, we're still here. And the challenges in this TV series seemed almost relentless. It was one thing after the other thing after the other thing. But of all the things that happened in this series, because I told Liz, if this isn't a picture of the church, I don't know what is. Because there were a lot of glorious things that happened on that journey. And there were people that actually along that way, even though there were challenges, they grew strong together. Many of them, they were married along the way. They had kids along the way, and, and they were still a community. But one of the greatest challenges they faced was disunity. What destroyed the group and what destroyed uh, the joy of the journey was the fact that there was all this disunity. You see it in all ten of the episodes. The biggest hindrance was disunity. It's a constant lack of unity that destroyed any joy that they may have experienced on their journey. They came against leadership. Some of them went back, said, we're not going to make this trip anymore. They went back. They didn't make it, a lot of them. Some of them were splintered and took off in a different route saying, we're not going to cross the river. We're going to go around the river. And they got caught up in a, in a storm in the winter and they never made it to their destination. Some quit. And I said, man, that's just like the church. Their entire journey was riddled with conflict. But at the end of the day, there was a remnant that arrived in paradise. Come on, church. There was a remnant that stayed in there. They, they, they followed leadership. They stayed true to their vision. And at the end of the day, they made it to paradise. They made it to Oregon. So it kind of ended on a good note, even though all those things were happening. The lesson learned is this, though. The journey is as important as the destination itself. And I, I want to call upon all of you, whether you are a pastor or a, a ministry lead or, 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 or just somebody that's going along for the ride and you're there or a part of the church, I want to tell you that it, it, it's very important to realize that the journey is just as important as the destination. Your life and your ministry can be tragic or glorious, and guess what? Much of it is a decision on your part. Liz and I decided years ago that we're not going to fall victim to the tragedies and the disappointments of ministry, that we are going to continue our journey to paradise and we're going to enjoy what God is doing. Attitude determines altitude, right? Through the years, we've seen people that have come and gone in our church. Some quit, some left, some took another route, some went back. There have been disappointments along the way, but I'm not going to allow setbacks to rob me of the blessing of the journey. So the title of this sermon is Divine Infusion, because I think that's what we all need. Divine Infusion. An infusion is the introduction of a new element or quality of something. An infusion is the joining of two or more things together to form a single entity. That's what we're ministering about. That's what the conference is all about. And if you're battle-weary this morning... I'm praying for a divine effusion, a divine infusion in your life. I want to open up my main text. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. And it's Paul pleading with the Corinthian church. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's very definitive. That's very strong. 
Listen to what he's saying. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. What a, we could just park there for so long because there's so much here. Paul, having gone through all that he went through in ministry, Paul, having learned all that he learned about discipleship and church planting and all the things that he did, he says to the church, listen, I appeal to you. The New King James Bible says, I plead with you, church. Another translation says, I urge you. Another one says, I beg you. And so we see Paul crying out to the church saying, listen to me now. I appeal to you. I plead with you. I urge you. I beg you to listen. Paul's pleading with the church to comply with three things here in this scripture. Number one, to agree with one another on what we say, which is actually a reference to doctrine. That in order to experience unity and to be unified as a group of believers, there has to be a common doctrine that we adhere to and we understand. Everybody here, everybody here should be able to explain to people why Jesus is God. We should be able to articulate the, the, the essentials of our Christian walk, which is the resurrection, the virgin birth, the atonement on the cross, the Trinity, these basic things. So he's saying here, I need you to agree with one another in order to be in unity. Number two, avoid divisions. That's what he says. And we need to do that at all costs. You know, when you get a little bit older, because I'm there now, uh, you don't handle drama as well as you did when you were younger. You don't want it. You don't want to deal with it. I mean, I'm letting things go. Even my kids sometimes say, man, Dad, you've gotten real soft. I just don't want it anymore. I don't have the strength for it anymore. I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to, you know, just let it go. I, I let things go. Even they tell me, man, you used to be a lot harder than that, Dad, when we were young. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> Avoid divisions. And the third thing Paul says is to be perfectly united. Wow. Now, that's the challenge. I mean, we might be able to avoid divisions, and we might be able to agree on doctrine and learn that, but to be perfectly united, how on earth do we do that? There's only one perfect one. That's why we need a divine infusion. It's got to be God. We can't do it on our own strength. Can you say amen? Yet with that knowledge and with what Paul said, they still experienced church splits, petty arguments over church boundaries, encroachments, perceived intrusions, Invisible territories, holy wars, offenses. And these are all things that distract from our mission. I really like the illustration McKinnis gave us and with the line of people that you had. It was so awesome, brother. And to have one turn the wrong direction, everything stops there. I said, oh, God, I don't want to be that person that stops the flow of the Spirit, that stops somebody from getting saved because we've got petty arguments. So Paul pleads with the church to avoid petty divisions in the body of Christ and come together in unity. Yeah, but pastor, this guy did this and that pastor did that and the fellowship didn't help me with this, that, or the other thing. I've been offended. Has anybody here not ever been offended? <laughs> you know, one of the last things that Jesus said before he, he was on the cross, before he was hanging on a cross. One of the last things he said, we find in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, the first part of that scripture says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, It is impossible. Can you believe that? Jesus looked at his disciples. He's about to go to the cross, and one of the last things he leaves them with isn't God bless you and keep you. It wasn't one of these, you know, nothing like that. He didn't bless them. He, didn't. he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, it's impossible that offenses will not come. Are you hearing me? Now, why would Jesus tell him that? It was preparatory. Jesus wanted to prepare the church for the inevitability of personal attacks on them. He's warning them, saying, hey, I just want to remind you, it's going to happen. So be ready for it. He wanted to remind them that the offenses be a part of their journey, a part of their ministry. How many know spiritual warfare will always be a part of the church life? You can't avoid it. I actually had somebody come to me at an altar call one time. I was doing an altar call, and this guy came to me, and I was praying for him. And I said, I said you know, I'm just going to pray that the devil is in it. And he says, you know what? He actually said this. I leave the devil alone, and he leaves me alone. I said, oh, brother. <laughs> Who lied and told you that? That sounds like a convenient uh, agreement, doesn't it? I, I, I leave the devil alone, he leaves me alone. I'm safe. I, I, I don't go there. I don't do outreaches. I don't tithe. I, I'm just staying. I'm right. I leave the devil alone, he leaves me alone. 
Spiritual warfare is a part. I'm going to tell you, when you got saved, there was a target painted on your back, I'm sorry to say. 1 Peter 4.12, the Bible says, Beloved, who's he talking to? The church, the brothers, the sisters. He's saying, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. In other words, don't be shocked, don't be surprised, don't be astonished, don't be blown away, don't be defeated when things come against your life. Don't feel singled out when bad things happen to you. Face it. Sometimes the reward for serving God is an attack of the enemy. And then you can see people, why did that happen to me? You know, I don't even ask why anymore. I used to always want to know everything. I was a lawyer. I mean, I, I could, I'll take you to court. I want to know why, how. And, it, you know, I don't even ask why anymore. Why did that guy do that? Well, because he's crazy. Crazy people do crazy things. <laughs> I don't even ask why anymore. Why did she do that? Why did he say that? There's never an answer to that. They're asking the same thing about you. But Paul actually said what approves us as ministers of God in much patience, afflictions, necessities, and distresses. He understood. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. You want to know why? It rains on people. People get wet. In order to keep the unity of the Spirit, though, we've got to understand this. We've got to, we've got to really understand. Stop always feeling you need to defend yourself. Here we go. You want to keep some unity? Stop fighting the wrong battles. Stop majoring on minor issues. Stop acting the gangster. Pastor. The closest I came to a gangster was, homie, don't you know me? And they had to put, they had to put fake tattoos on me. I don't have one tattoo on my body. They use eye, uh, what do you call it? Eyebrow pencil, and they put tattoos on me to fake it. The only thing is, when I was sweating up there, my tattoos ran down my arm. <laughs> Our text in 1 Corinthians 1.10 says that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. You'll never do that. You'll never fulfill that without a divine infusion of God's Spirit. We're to work together to reach a dying and lost world. That's what we need to stay focused on. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. They answered the question of why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why do we receive the Holy Spirit? We're the, we, we are the seed of Christ. Did you know that? We are the people. Jesus is multiplying himself today through us, his body. The body of Christ. And we've been ordained to continue the precise ministry that Jesus was involved in. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. The book of Acts is all about people that took that call seriously. Men and women that took the Great Commission seriously. In Acts 2.1, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Listen to this now. Let's, let's dissect this a little bit. The Bible says they were all with one accord in one place. Being in accord, by definition, is to gather in a united way. We can all be here in the same place here this morning, but not necessarily be in one accord. So it's not just getting together, it's being united when you get together. A common cause, a common doctrine, a common vision. And if you noticed... First, they were in one accord, they were in unity. Then there came a sound from heaven. You want to hear from heaven? That wasn't a test question. You want to hear from heaven? Okay. Then recalibrate your heart. Be of one accord. Find yourself in unity. Allow a divine infusion to take place in your heart, in your life, in your ministry. Now, you ready for this? Don't expect the anointing to fall if you're not walking in unity. Well, that's a big statement. Don't expect the power of God. Don't expect the anointing to fall on you if you're not united with God, the Holy Spirit, God-appointed leadership, your church, your fellowship. 
Look at the rich young ruler in the Bible. There's a guy that could have been the 13th disciple, but you never heard about him again because he wasn't willing to pay any kind of price for ministry. Now, Paul's reminder to us, Ephesians 4, 4. The Bible says there's, well, we've heard the scripture all, all the week here at conference. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. There it is. We need to come in alignment with these things. Ephesians 4, 16, the whole body joined and knit together. As every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Are you doing your share? No, no, not in gossiping. Are you doing your share in ministry? Every part does its share. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It edifies the church. There's a Latin phrase that was used. E pluribus unum. Anybody hear that? E pluribus unum. It was used to stamp the coins up until 1956. As a matter of fact, I have one right here. I have a silver dollar, 1900. This is uh, 122 years old. This is a silver dollar, 1900, and it says on the silver dollar, E pluribus unum. I forgot to give them the thing, but it's right here. E pluribus unum. And with that, it's used, it was used to stamp all the currency, all the coins. E pluribus unum translate out of many, one. That's what they used to put on the coins. They wanted America to know that they're all about one. It had something to do initially with the 13 colonies coming together, but it is also extended to all of the immigrants that were coming and flooding into America. And they said, listen, here's what it's all about. E pluribus unum. We're putting it on our currency, on our coins, something that you're going to use every day, see every day, to be reminded that out of many, one. It was a national motto for the United States until it was replaced in 1956 with In God We Trust. And it seems like we're having a problem with both of those mottos, even today, a hundred and something years later. Unity is hard to come by. The reason for E Pluribus Unum was to bring people together, to remind everybody. It served as a reminder that we will have a nation of multiple ethnicities, cultures, races, flooding into America, out of many, one, an attempt to blend, an attempt to unify. Like they say, Los Angeles is the melting pot of ethnicity. But I've worked the streets of L.A., and it's not a melting pot of ethnicity. It's more like a, it's more like a mosaic, different parts just kind of next to each other. And this person hates that person because that's a Chino and that's a Mexican and that's a, you're from Nicaragua and you're from El Salvador and you're from here and you're from there and you're a white boy and you're this and you're that and you're black. Even today we struggle. I mean, it's a great motto. Don't get me wrong. It was a great idea and a great motto and a great attempt. But without an infusion, without a divine infusion, we're left on our own trying to work things out and we're still having the same problems today. Have we come a long way? Yes, we have. But we got a long way to go. Can you say amen? And then they tell us, listen, it's a call for tolerance, mutual respect for people that are different than ourselves. You know, I've always struggled with that word tolerant because it gives me the feeling as though, or it implies as though I've got to tolerate you, put up with you, endure you. But God's got a higher standard of unity than the coins, than the phrases of this world. God's standard of unity is much higher and he expects us to be family, not just respect each other from a distance or not just to tolerate each other, but to blend together, to be together, to be the body of Christ, to be the church of Jesus Christ. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. A great thought. See, the problem is you can't effectively legislate morality or ethics. There has to be a change of heart. Not that I don't appreciate certain laws in place to protect us and all these things, but you cannot effectively legislate morality. There has to be a change of heart, and that's where the church comes in. Can I hear an amen? amen. I want to give a scripture, go to the Old Testament, Psalms 133.1. The Bible says, Behold, and we know this one, 
Behold how good, let's read it together. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. I want to break this down quickly with the time I have remaining. I want to talk about the desirability of unity. Number one, unity is good. Unity is good. It's to be desired. Number two, unity is pleasant. It makes life more enjoyable. Unity makes life more enjoyable. It makes the journey worth the destination. See, there's a lot of things in life that are good but not pleasant. And there are a lot of things in life that are pleasant but not necessarily good. And here the psalmist is describing unity as both good and pleasant. The blessing of the Lord saying, you can have good and pleasant if you're in unity. God's desire is that we all live and die in unity. You say, well, what, what, what do you mean die? Because some start off right, but they don't finish too good. God wants us to start off right and finish strong. This is not a thing where I've got to make an adjustment for this week or today or just while I'm preaching or while I'm in church, because you know how we are in church. God bless you, brother. We see the best of everybody in church. But maybe you haven't stood outside the church door for a while and watched the couple taking laps in their car around. They can't even park until they're done with their good argument. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could happen. You see it in church, too. And I've said it before. People don't have marriage problems. They have God problems. You want to know what Jesus prayed the night before the cross? John 17, 20. He says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all that will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one. Speaking to the Father, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. I've given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I'm in them, you're in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know, come on now, that the world will know that you sent me. Come on, the validity of our message is our ability to model Christ the best we can. And that you love them as much as you love me. That's intercessory prayer if you haven't picked up on that. At its best, Jesus, the high priest, is praying for you, praying for me right here. It's like the high priest entering the tabernacle who carried on his heart, his chest, his tribes, his people. And he's interceding. And his prayer is that we would be one with him and with one another. This is perfect unity. That's what it is. It's divine unity. There's no perfectness in ourselves. We've got to tap into the anointing. We're talking about, oh, the anointing makes me be able to do a good job at this or a good job. The anointing is going beyond your ability. That's what the anointing is. The anointing is God's ability to go beyond your ability and my ability. He says that the world will know that you sent me. The world is looking for something different than what they have. That's why I really appreciated Jack Hayford when he told all of us pastors, he says, let the church be the church. Because we want to get so close to the world, we just want to bring them in those doors. And once we do, then we'll kind of switch on them. But no, it's like a bait and switch is what they call it. But, but you know something? We need to be the church. They're out there and they're saying, listen, we, 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 we've tried drugs, we've tried sex, we've tried alcohol, we've tried everything. And nothing's happening and nothing's working. Where's the church? Where is the church? While they're, we're dividing lines and we're divided, I'll tell you, demons aren't divided. You ever hear of a demon casting out another demon? They're united in their effort. It's the church that's breaking up. We need to be strong. We need to be united. We need to high-five each other and know why we're here. We're not called to be a souped-up version of our lost neighbors. Psalms 133.2 It, unity, is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. i got to do this like super quick. I think i got two or three minutes here. The oil is a special blend of oil. According to Deuteronomy, it's a, it's a very expensive and, and very calculated blend of oils. It's called the ho holy oil. Number one, unity is sacred. We've got to take it as sacred. 
all right? It's to be guarded. It's to be cherished. I really appreciated that word, uh, Philemon, which is to be guarded and watched over. Number two, unity is soothing. These are the things we'll experience if we find ourselves in unity, folks. If you didn't figure that out, it's right here. It's sacred. It's soothing. Number three, it's fragrant, a sweet-smelling aroma. It's just a nice thing. to. Don't you like being around somebody that's got just a good attitude? You can smell it as you walk into the room. We're here to diffuse unity. What we say to people, what we say about people. Hello? The spirit of unity is something that you carry with you. You don't just pull it out of a... Being a sweet fragrance. Number four, unity comes from God. Verse two again, it's like the precious oil upon the head running down. Now, here's the big question I leave you with here this morning. Is there room in your heart this morning for a divine infusion of unity? Is there someone in the back of your mind as you've been hearing these sermons and these preachings and worshiping the Lord and praying during this conference, is there somebody in your heart and your mind that you know you need to go to and make right or at least start in your heart and forgive? You know the word forgive in the Greek means to send forth. It's a phrase. You know the Greek language is awesome. I use it a lot because they, they use phrases for a word that we might use. And we say forgive, and they say send forth. Don't leave it inside of you. Don't keep it inside. Don't let it fester. Send it forth. Forgive those that have come against you. And last, verse 3, it's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. How many want the blessing and life evermore? Amen. Father, we pray for a divine infusion of unity. Help us to find ways and places that we can agree upon and not always look at the fault and the negative. Bless us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My big little brother. This is my big little brother right here. Want to pose up? No, no, you don't win. I already made some money. Praise. <laughs> Fight me for it. I'm feeling a little offended. Amen. I got to go quick because of time. Is that all right? Amen. I don't, are you worried about a break or the word? Word. Yeah. Amen. I'm, they got to play with my mic a little bit. I know that. So hopefully you guys, is it good? All right. Um, I wanted to start off with this. I got a story because of Pastor Philemon. When Pastor Philemon was talking about the hamburger, you guys remember that? What, what I liked about that was I was going to start with a story, and uh, the story is this. There was a time in my life where I was forced onto a worship team at Huntington Park Praise Chapel. <laughs> my wife was the worship leader. My best friend, Thabo, was on the worship team with me, and we got kicked off of that worship team. I, I don't know how many times. But at some point, my wife and the worship team, they began to push me that I needed to sing, and they wanted me to get out in the front, you know, and lead a song. And singing in front of people, uh, speaking in front of people really wasn't something I was interested in, you know, over 20 years ago. And so I was really nervous about it, and they pushed me, they prodded me, they, and, and, and then they said, now you're going to do this song at the conference at Knott's Berry Farm in the Charles Schultz Theater with a few thousand people. I, I pushed myself through the fear. I, you know, I, I went through it. I, I did the burden of it. I, I overcame it. And I go out there. It's my time to sing. And I get out there. And I say, I feel like I'm full. And then there's this hand, Pastor Philemon.
It was my wonderful Pastor Donna. <laughs> because just like this morning, we were running out of time. And she takes the mic from my hand. Fly! I went back to my wife and said, I am never, ever doing a solo again. I could have taken great offense to that. Here's another story. There was a time in my life before I became a pastor and went to San Jacinto where I, I went to my pastor. And in fact, we had over for dinner. And we said, I feel like God's calling me to go to Turkey. You remember that? I said, God's calling me to go to Turkey. I'm going to go to Turkey. Here's the problem. I had spent a few minutes with Pastor Larry. Don't spend any time with Pastor Larry. <laughs> unless you want to go somewhere. Because it's, he's going he's gonna to infuse something into you. I didn't even know I wanted to go to Turkey. I don't think I did. But he said it to me and then I was messed up. We invited her over. I said, Pastor, I want to go to Turkey. God's calling me. I hear the voice of God. You know what she had the nerve to say to me? No. <laughs> Doesn't she understand that I'm hearing from God? Come on, somebody. Doesn't my pastor understand that, that I'm hearing from God? A sermon, my sermon this morning is called Offense, and it's a play on words, because offense, or being offended, offense builds offense. There was a moment there where there was some offense in my heart toward my Are you guys hearing me? And God had to work that through, and thank God he was able to, because now I'm in San Jacinto, him at and San Jacinto and, and wonderful people, Varek and Joey, I, I see you guys out there. Uh, I, I'm blessed. I'm so glad that my pastor said no. Because for the past 15 years, I've been in a wonderful city. And I've seen God do miracles and wonderful things. I want to just throw a bunch of stuff at you this morning and hopefully it, it, it sticks with you. If I could throw eggs at you, I would throw an egg at you right now. <laughs> Think about this with me. Try to unscramble an egg. <laughs> Try it. Go home, crack an egg into your pan, run a fork through it one time, and then try to unscramble that egg. You know what will happen? It will get more and more what? Scrambled. You will never be able to put it back together because there's this law, the second law of thermodynamics. It is called entropy. Entropy is interesting. It's a huge word. I don't have time to get all into it. But really what this word means is that it's known in science that once you separate something from the oneness it was supposed to be, entropy begins to set in, and it means that chaos will begin to ensue. Or other words for it is deterioration, breakup, collapse, decay, decline, degeneration, destruction, or a worsening. The word literally means in the Greek a transforming, but it means a transforming that will always move toward chaos. Well, that's interesting to me is if you go into the beginning in Genesis when God created the world, it says that the earth was without form, right? And it was void and it was dark, but that word is really chaos. It's the same word. If you go back into that, you'll see that, that it means meaningless arguments. Go look it up. I don't understand that. But before the world was formed, uh, that's one of the definitions, that, that there was like these meaningless arguments. See, if you're not catching it this morning, some of us are going to live in a world of darkness and without form and tons of void, and we're going to live there because of meaningless arguments that might happen in the church. Hallelujah. You with me? John 17, 21 says that they may all be one. I know we've heard these scriptures all week, but that they may all be one. 
Father, you are in me, I in you, that there will be in us, so that the world may believe. The world is already in chaos. Turn on the news. It already has that. It already has meaningless arguments. It's not looking to the church for more meaningless arguments. It's looking for us to be one. 1 Corinthians 12 says, uh, I'm just going to go through what it, what it brings about. In that chapter, it says we all have different gifts, but yet we're all important to the body. We are many members. We're all being equally important. He ends it with that there be no division in the body of Christ. Ecclesiastes, to paraphrase 4, 9 through 12, says what? Two are better than one. Because if you fall by yourself, who's going to pick you up? A three-chord three strand is not easily broken. When you and I stand together, we're much more powerful. Much more powerful. You can get one horse and it can pull a certain amount of weight. Do you know this? You get two horses, it can pull four times the amount of weight. Not double, four times. I can do something of my own, but if me and Pastor Jason come together, we can do four times more, right? If you and I come together, we can do much, much more. Ephesians 4.16, the whole body joined together, every joint. And then it says, when it's all working, see that word? Properly. Oh, come on now. Properly. It says the body will grow and build itself up in love. See, part of our problem, I love the Tower of Babel. I love that whole story. There's a lot in there. I, I'm going to do something with you. I'm going to take some license. But let me read this, and then I'm going I'm to flip the script on you. Genesis 11, it says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. Catch this. This is for a bad reason, but you need to catch something. That even in evil things, these principles are true. It says, behold, they are one people, they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing they propose will be impossible for them. So God comes down, that's one principle. The next one is, God understands that if these people are one, they will be able to do anything, and it's for an evil purpose, so I'm going to use entropy and separate them, and cause confusion. Now why is this important? Because if heaven knows this, Satan knows it. And Satan is, he's got no new, new stuff. Have you noticed that? He's got, he doesn't have a new bag of tricks. He uses the same old stuff. He counterfeits what God does. He always counterfeits. So, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip the script, and I'm going to see, say that Satan looks on the earth, and he sees Praise Chapel and the a body of Christ come together as one people and say, we're going to win the world for Jesus Christ. We're not going to have meaningless arguments. Uh, we're not going to build fences between us. Uh, but there are some dead people out there that need to hear the gospel. And we're going to come together and make it happen. And so here's Satan's response. Now, all the Christians had one mind, the mind of Christ. And they all had one spirit, the Holy Spirit. And they all had one word, the word of God. It was the same word. So Satan, behold, they are one people. And they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what Praise Chapel and Christians are going to do. And nothing they propose is going to be impossible for them. So come, let me go up and confuse them so that they may not understand one another's speech. And therefore, they will be separated. I love when Pastor Philemon said that. He said, he said, do you have another English, right? Do you understand? Chris Tucker, right? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> Sometimes it's like that in the church. You're offended. Did you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> Satan loves to use uh, the same things that God uses, but he manipulates and twists them and destroys lives. I bring this up because we have a greater work to do. If you're stuck arguing with people, 
You're never going to get to the, the great good thing that God has for you. It's never going to happen. In fact, in Jeremiah 12, I, I love it because in Jeremiah 12, he, he's complaining about people. You know, you know I've been in church for, uh, my entire life, 25 years. Let me tell you what I know to be true. The number one church killer is people problems. It's not doctrine. It's not doctrine. It's, not those. it's that people can't get along with each other. People get offended by leadership. It, it's always a people issue. Jeremiah is having this problem in verse 12. People are coming against him. Uh, they want to kill him, but it's just words at this point. He goes to God. He begins to complain. We all do that. He begins to complain that these people you've put here, they're, they, they're talking about you, but their hearts are far from you. And then he says in verse 3, but you, Lord, you know me. You know my heart, God. I'm not like those people. I'm the good one in the church. <laughs> Come on now. We all get offended. He begins to pray a prayer. He says, Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and set them apart for the day of slaughter. Please don't pray that about people in the church. Some of you got to repent for this morning's prayer. It's interesting though, right? Offense makes us stagnant. See, here's what I love. King David had three mighty men. But you know where he found those men? He didn't find them great. He found them in a cave called Adullam. But here's what's interesting. If you read out the definition in the original language, it was a bunch of men that were offended. Oh, come on, somebody. Here it is. Adullam is dead center between Gath and Bethlehem. When I read that, I thought it was so interesting because we know we're, we're running from our giant, and we know we need to get to Christ, but somewhere along the way in our offense... We've went into a cave called Adullam, and unless you and I are willing to let the king who's going to come in pull us out and take us on a mission, we're never going to get to the great things. We're always going to be the people in the cave of Adullam, deteriorating, entropy, chaos, meaningless arguments. Who's greater than this? Who's better than that? They didn't become mighty until they left their offense. But look what God says to Jeremiah in verse 5. Here's God's answer. He says, if you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how are you ever going to run with the horses? I've got something big for you. I've got spiritual warfare for you. And you're going to argue with this person? You're going to give up the horse for that? People, it's time we quit giving each other black eyes and we started giving the devil a black eye. Come on, somebody, give the devil a black eye. It's interesting, right? We get so caught up with people and there's these spiritual horses, spiritual warfare. Let me tell you something. Spiritual warfare is not hiding in your closet and screaming at the devil and his demons. Spiritual warfare is going out to a dead person, a dead man, and a dead woman and pulling them up out of the grave with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, spiritual warfare is deciding to be a disciple even when you don't agree with your leadership. Because guess what? As much as I think I'm hearing from God, He set them in authority over us. Uh, and if we will humble ourselves, there is a safety in that net. And I thank God my pastor said no. What if I would have left an offense? I'd be in Turkey, but I'd be a turkey. <laughs> Isn't it funny that we're always David and never Goliath? You're always Jesus and never Judas. <laughs> You're always the prophet, never Jezebel. Come on, somebody. 
You notice that anytime someone preaches about a hero in the Bible, yeah, that's me. But then you pray, you pray, Lord, make me more like Jesus. But then your next prayer is, God, I don't understand. There's a Judas in my life. Make me more like Jesus. God, I don't understand why these people are rejecting me. Make me more like Jesus. Lord, I don't understand. It feels like I'm being crucified out here. Come on, somebody. We, we want to be more like Jesus, but we don't ever want God to truly answer that prayer. Because if he answered it, your patience is going to get tested. People are going to reject you. You better grow some thick skin because people are going to start throwing some rocks at you. But I don't know about you. I'm willing to go through the pain of that kind of discipleship because I know on the other side of those offenses, there's a horse that needs a black eye. There's somebody that needs me to step into their situation with God that's inside of me. Separation of flesh and spirit. Jeremiah goes on. He has some crazy stuff happen after this. That's what God was trying to prepare him for. He gets arrested several times. Uh, he gets sunken in mud one time. Uh, he's thrown in prison. He's put in stocks. Uh, all of his troubles he's complaining about now when it just has to do with people. God is saying, man, I've got something so much better for you. You see, a horse in the Bible represents war, power, and glory. War, power, and glory. Look at this, Ephesians 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers, in this present darkness, against spiritual forces in, in heavenly places. Our battles are in the heavenlies. Some of you need to get more mad at the devil than you keep getting mad at each other. You see, I, I like this. Uh, when Jesus was walking towards the grave of Lazarus. It says that he groaned in himself. Have you ever read that? That's not a really good translation because it really means uh, that he was snorting in anger. That's what it means. In fact, it references in the lexicon that this is the sound that a war horse makes when it heads into a battle. That that horse will go, it'll make this snort. It's using that specific word. So we, we, Jesus is not the, the, the Jesus always petting the lamb. He's the one that goes and makes a whip and comes back and starts spanking some people. Come on, somebody. He's the God that, that when he sees somebody's dead in a tomb, he's not, he's not worried about it. He's not a sissy. He's not, you know, because he cried, oh, Lazarus is dead. No. Jesus, his friend is dead. I have a big imagination. Pretend I've got hair. Here's my hair flying in the wind. My eyes full of fire. My nostrils as big as a horse. That's the picture of Jesus. Because someone's dead. I want to picture the disciples standing here and they're arguing who's the best and Jesus is seeing that someone needs to be rescued by the gospel and he's got to step, step on them, right? Who's the best? I don't got time for that. Well, this person said this. I don't got time for that. Come on, man. Someone in the church needs to start doing that. We need to start saying, when people come, eh, say, ah, I don't got time for that. There are people dying. There's homeless people. There's prostitutes. Uh, there's sons and daughters that are prodigal. There are people that are broken. Uh, there are people that are committing suicide right now. Are you serious? If you can't tread with men on foot, you're never going to be able to run with the horses. I'm hoping someone will join me on that quest. I'm going to go into training. Pastor Philemon and I might go to Ghana together, maybe Kenya, because I told him I need to learn how to wrestle and fight the lions. And <laughs> I 
I realize, though, he's, he's Kenyan. They can run fast. <laughs> and I know that he only has to run faster than me, so I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Let me end here. Proverbs 18, 19 is interesting to me. It says, a brother offended is like a strong city. In fact, he's, he's, he's more stronger than a strong city. Here's what's cool about this scripture is, you know, back then if a city was considered strong, the reason was the gates. It was always the gates, the walls and the gates. Why is that important? Because the Bible says that Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell, that's why he says it, the gates of hell, the, strong, the stronghold will not come against it. But we just read that a brother offended has stronger gates than a city. Wow. See, here it is. The devil doesn't have to raise the gates of hell against God's kingdom because Satan is really good at getting us to raise our own gates against God's kingdom. He gets our gates against each other, our fortress, our fences that we build with offense. And he attacks the church from within the church. From within. And he's laughing because in our prayers we're binding the devil. And the devil's saying, binding me, that's funny. You should be binding yourself. <laughs> you should get a slingshot, boom, pop yourself in the forehead for once. <laughs> Let me say this for time. I'm going to cut it off here. Here's something I just love. Let me leave you with this. David... When he goes out to fight Goliath, he picks five rocks. Can I take some license here? Because I don't, I don't know, but it's interesting. Because his confidence level was huge. You ever read that story? Did, he, did it seem like he was nervous? Like he might not win? No, read that story. That kid was like, you're dead. What do I get? Your daughter? Boom. Right? It's like what Pastor Philemon said. He said, I get her, right? When he saw his wife, I'm done. He's dead. Confident. Yes. But he picked five rocks. I always thought that was weird because we know the first one sank. The first one went right in. Take some license here. Goliath had four brothers. And he did end up fighting them later. I think it's interesting. I, I think that David knew if I take out this brother, his brothers are going to come. Let me add five. Let me add some rocks so I'll be ready. But here's the problem. This is, this is what God showed me. In the church, we're like David. We pick up rocks to throw at each other just in case. Just in case. I've got my offense right here. Well, come on, somebody. This is what I, I, I propose as I run off the stage before Jason strangles me. <laughs> is that we quit throwing those rocks at each other. Here, here's the deal. Some of us have so many rocks in our pockets for our brothers and sisters, and you're wondering why you feel so heavy? You're wondering why it's hard to walk? Pastor, I don't know what's going on. Well, I do. Why don't we take those rocks out this morning? Take them out. And this was my thought. Do we say we leave them at the altar? No. We throw them at the fence. The fence that you've built in your life. You take those rocks out and say, you know what? And you start pelting that fence, that offense. And when you watch it come crumbling down, here's what's beautiful. You see the perspective on the other side of the fence. Because when you've built a fence, you have no idea what's going on on the other side. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Help us, Lord. Give us some horses. And empower us with the Holy Spirit of God to fight them instead of each other. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Wow, that was some good word this morning. No, man, that was some good stuff. Woo. Hope you guys are taking notes, man. We're getting a lot of, lot of stuff this week. We're going to take about a 15-minute stretch, restroom, water, coffee, but 15 minutes, come right back in for a little bit of worship. I'm excited to have my friend Pastor Brian Worth with us from Chapel of Change. He's going to minister the word, so come on back in about 15 minutes.